Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Welcome into the JMU Sports News Podcast. My name is Jack Fitzpatrick. No Bennett Conlin again this week as we start off this week with another interview with an NFL prospect from James Madison. Of course, Devin Ravenel joins the podcast to talk with us about his pre-NFL workouts, what he's doing to get prepared, what happened at Pro Day, and some of his memories from JMU and what it was like to grow within the JMU program following the footsteps of his brother, Brandon Ravenel. But before we dive into that interview, uh, we want to let you guys know that Bet Online remains your number one source for all of your college basketball betting needs this season. Get analysis of every play, prop, and point at Bet Online. You'll always find the latest odds, bracket contests, team matchups, and game trends at Bet Online. Updated odds for everything from live games, the conference championships, right through the final four in the championship game. Well, folks, that already happened. So you can use them to do golf, get prepared for the NFL draft. Everything that you can imagine, Bet Online has. It was your college basketball headquarters. It's now your NBA playoff and NHL playoff headquarters. Head to betonline.ag today or use your mobile device to sign up and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first time deposit. You want to sign up with Bet Online? Use promo code BELIEVE. That's promo code B L E A V. And when you sign up, deposit, let's say 100 bucks, they'll credit your account with a $50 free bet. So, Head on over to betonline.ag, enter promo code BLEAV, promo code BELIEVE to get started. Bet online, where the game starts. And another place where the game starts, you can get your Saturdays started ahead of JMU football just a few months away. You can get lacrosse game day started over there. You can get baseball, softball, everything. Every JMU sport game day started over at the Harrisonburg Three Notched location, the Valley Collab House. We want to shout out Three Notch, the official beer. I guess you can say the official beer of JMU Sports News. An amazing sponsor. Head on over to the Valley Collab House in Harrisonburg so you can get drinking all of the amazing beers they have on tap. They have some awesome merch in there. You can buy four packs, six packs to go, growlers to go, crowlers to go. Everything you need is over at the Valley Collab House. If you're in Richmond, uh, if you're in Roanoke, if you're in Charlottesville, Virginia Beach, I believe as well, you can check out their local uh, their local tap houses, tap rooms there as well. Check them out and uh, let them know that JMU Sports News sent you. You can also sign up for their Fresh Beer Club. Uh, ask about that when you head on into their tap rooms. Fresh Beer Club, you pay, an, pay a little bit of money every single month. Essentially like a membership where you're getting exclusive goodies and exclusive beers and fresh beer each and every month so you can taste your way through the three-notched collection. Well, now we're joined by Devin Ravenel, a second-generation JMU football player who's coming off of his career year in 2022, 10 receiving uh, touchdowns over his last two years with the Dukes coming off of a career high in touchdowns. You had the tied for team lead in receiving touchdowns as well in 2022. Devin, how are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's beautiful outside today. How are you doing? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it is really beautiful. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, they've been mowing the grass all day, and it's been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, the allergies beating my butt right now. <laughs> thankfully, uh, thankfully, I don't have allergies, so thank goodness on that front. But uh, yeah, I can only imagine. Definitely a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> so you just wrapped up Pro Day. Can you go over how Pro Day went for you? Or I guess not just anymore, a few weeks now in the past when we're recording this. But uh, can you go over how Pro Day went for you and uh, what your expectations were going into it and what your expectations are now coming out of it? Um, you know, I, I felt like it definitely helped me out a good amount. Um, I definitely had some numbers in mind that I didn't hit for some and that I exceeded for others. So it was kind of like a, a wish wash mm -hmm. event for me, like personally. But I mean, in all, uh, I, I ran good on my 40 like I wanted to. Um, I jumped good uh, and I ran good. I had good routes and caught the ball well, did good on an individual drill. So I feel like it overall is a good one. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, as a receiver, what what is your workout that you're prepping most for? I know I'm a Seahawks fan. So DK Metcalf, they always talk about his three cone drill was terrible. Like <laughs> what, what's what's that what's that workout that you're really looking forward to and trying to do the best at? 
Um, well, really the 40, because that just like really sets it off, like gets all the eyes and all the attention and everything. So, you know, just get out there, try to run as fast as you can, and then just, just let the, everything else pave the way from there. Dope. So your brother went through the pre-draft process a few years back. How has his kind of, has he helped you out at all with that? Um, and if so, kind of how has that helped you throughout this process? Uh, it helped a lot because during, it was my spring break in high school and I was a junior in high school and I was like, kind of, I needed film coming out of high school. Uh, I had broke my collarbone during the season, so I didn't have a lot of film. So I was doing a lot of, uh, a lot of one day camps. So mm -hmm. we were kind of like going through the same thing. I was running a lot of forties and doing a lot of stuff at one day camp. So, um, I remember my spring break in high school, I came up here and he was training for his, um, training for his pro day. And, uh, I saw it like firsthand, so it's funny. And then I like see it from a bigger perspective and afterward, I like things he could have done and things that he did well. And it definitely helped me out a lot, like going through the process. It definitely eased me, eased my mind a lot. That's dope. So you broke your collarbone in, in high school. So yeah. how did you find your way to JMU? Did they offer you, like how did that, that process to get to JMU work for you? Uh, yeah, I ended up attending a one-day camp at JMU, and after I, I had went here, I had um, I had a one-day camp in Delaware the next day, and so me and my dad just making road trips <laughs> that whole spring, man, <laughs> it was ridiculous. And uh, on the way back from Delaware, and I was, it was so funny how it worked because I had I had not did as well as I wanted to at the Delaware one-day camp, and so I was just kind of like kind of mad about it and on the way home it's like pouring rain on the way home we got like a long drive ahead of us and then uh coach houston the old head coach yeah. called me and he was like yeah man uh I had to talk with the coaches and then that's when he offered me and everything so that's awesome yeah, so sure. coming to jmu kind of going in a little bit of a, a deeper side of the question here you are following your brother who uh put up some fantastic numbers while he was here but you made a name for yourself on your own. What what was that journey kind of like from when you first stepped onto campus? And and I assume it was kind of like Brandon's little brother and then growing into your own person throughout your five years at JMU. Right, right, for sure. Like you said, it was like perfectly explained. Um, when I first came in, it was definitely a, a very uncomfortable for me. Um, Brandon's little brother, you know, all, all the other people had known my brother, I played with him and stuff of that sort. So, um, it was definitely difficult getting into the swing of things, like trying to make my own name, trying to get comfortable with everybody, like figure out who like wants the best for me, who doesn't, um, who I want to surround myself with, like all those things. Like I was, I was a young kid. And then, you know, with the experience and with living on your own for those like first like two years and then uh, COVID had hit. So it was a little difficult. Like that was like the biggest time where I had to grow up like that junior year, kind of start figuring things out. And so um, it was definitely difficult with the process of the way things went with, with COVID and everything because the fall season got pushed, pushed to spring. Then I ended up um, getting injured, didn't play that, that junior season in the COVID year, getting hip surgery. So um, it was definitely difficult like going through all that, but once um that fall season hit and I kind of came came back toward the end coming off an injury and then this past season it was it was a lot of support from the teammates I mean the coaches the coach changed it was it was a lot but it it definitely grew on me personally it definitely helped build character and um definitely developed me and definitely helped my discipline for sure can you walk us through kind of what COVID was like for you as a football player, like all the uncertainty going into that fall season. I remember Signetti was tweeting out things like we'll play anyone anywhere. And we're as fans, we were sitting back like, are we going to play just a random schedule like against Virginia Tech and UVA three times? This season? Like, <laughs> What's happening? But from a player perspective, it probably felt even crazier. Can you walk us through what that time was like? Um, So we reported – and like usually in the summer we would report early, like we would get uh maybe like half a month off and then we come back at the end of May. But we had ended up coming back in August. That's when they had us report, which is like toward 
camp would start pretty much. Yeah. And um, we came back and it was like this all mass everywhere, um, like keeping distance from everybody. You can't be around everybody. Only a certain amount of people could be in certain buildings at a certain time. So it was very weird at first. It was very weird. And then um, when we started working out after all, like everybody had gotten tested and gone through like that process and everything. And uh, that first COVID pop happened. And then um, we were wearing those little trackers to oh, see. Yeah. So pretty much we would have a tracker on our foot to track um, like who we were around and how long we were around them. So if we were around somebody for like more, I think it was more than 15 minutes or something at a certain time and they ended up popping for COVID, then you had a quarantine for two weeks. And so the first time that somebody got popped for COVID, I was contact trace. And so I had a quarantine for two <laughs> weeks. <laughs> oh man. And so I don't I don't really like know much. I was just hanging out at home. I felt perfectly fine. I just couldn't do anything for two weeks. So I just stayed in my house, drank on my own, <laughs> Damn. Ate, did everything and then came back and I want to say like a week later somebody else had pop positive and I got contact trace again and so I had a quarantine again for like two weeks as soon as I got back so and it just it was a it was a lot of that it was a big process of that and so it kept Man. happening games kept getting canceled like going into it and so um by the time we we finally had played that after that first game is when I had um my hip started bugging me. I don't even think I finished the first game. Mm -hmm. I had like gotten taken out halfway through the third, third, the third quarter or something like that. And um, it was a lot of testing, a lot of COVID testing, man. Yeah, uh, a lot of contact tracing. <laughs> that sounds that sounds terrible. That sounds yeah. no fun. Um, yeah. So throughout your career, you caught passes from Danucci, Cole Johnson, Todd Santeo. I mean, an NFL QB, a uh, guy in your class, potential NFL QB, and you got Cole Johnson, CAA player of the year, was balling out. I kind of got two questions from this. The first one, not asking for who – every wide receiver, I feel like, has their favorite type of passer, right? Who was your favorite quarterback of those three? Or if it was someone else on the roster at any point, who's been your favorite quarterback to catch balls from? That's a hard question. That's a hard question because they, <laughs> they all do. They they all have their their pros. They exactly. All they all got. They all have. I, Danucci had that weird sidearm sometimes throwing like a baseball Danucci player. Danucci had crazy arm talent. The, probably the best arm talent I've ever seen. Damn. But um, Cole. I mean, I I like I I grew up with Cole pretty much. Like yeah. through, like through the uh, program, like all the two minute we did. Like I. I don't know if I can pick Todd. I actually play with Todd, so I'm gonna be biased towards Todd too. Like, because <laughs> I actually play with him. I actually like got to yeah. like, meaningful like experience on the field with him. So I don't know. I can't. I, I don't think I can. I don't think I can pick. I'm gonna have to plead the fifth on this one. So plead the a, fifth. a question you won't have to plead the fifth for. I mean, you're playing with QBs at that level. What does it do to your own game as a receiver to have a quarterback at such a high level? Like, what does that do to your own? your own growth, your own game itself? Um, it puts a lot more responsibility on yourself and you just, it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to trust, trust like the guys around you. Cause you, you got somebody at quarterback that's commanding people listen to him and he's, he's always doing the right thing. Knows what he's doing, knows his reads, knows where he's going with the ball. Like, like all I got to do is do what I got to do. Like all I got to do is my job, do it a hundred percent, do it fast, do it right. Like I, all I gotta do is work on my game at that point. So it's just it's just a trust thing. It just makes it things a lot easier. Um, and I've been blessed to have three quarterbacks of of that nature, like through the yeah. process. So definitely help. And you're coming off of this last season. You mentioned Todd and you had a good connection. You tied for the team lead in receiving touchdowns. You tied with Chris Thornton. You did it in as like half the amount of receptions. What was it where you were like a magnet to the end? It's it's I you probably did the math, like 25% of your catches were like touchdowns. What what was it that you were the target in those scenarios? Um, it was just a lot of the red zone concepts. What I I, I kind of was uh the main guy and a good amount of them. And so it was just, it just put me in a better position to score. 
And so, um, you know, KT he would have his plays and he would, and he was making his plays, obviously. Yeah. But um, I feel like some of the route combinations that we had in the red zone that they um, I would just I would just kind of be in the right position that they would have me. So, and so. yeah, you were in the right position a lot in that coastal game. I think 102 <laughs> yards, two touchdowns. Yeah, I mean the team as a whole just kind of feasted on the Chanticleers, whatever that is. But <laughs> kind of you finished out your JMU career with. I, I don't have all your stats in front of me, but I want to go out on a limb and say it was a career best day overall. Hundred percent. What, what was it like to finish out your JMU career with a game like that? Uh, it was it, it was bittersweet. It was very bittersweet. Um, I, I was definitely happy to go out in a bang, and I, and I knew it was my last one too. It was like it was no playoffs. Like <laughs> you, you don't know if you're gonna win the win or lose the next game. Yeah. Like it's just you knew it was your last game. It was it was very bittersweet, but. I don't know. Was, I, I loved it. it was, I wouldn't want to go out any other, any other way, honestly. And and with that that final jump, no playoffs. It was that final game because of that jump going from FCS to FBS. Right. What was that jump like <clears throat> from a weekly basis? You guys went from playing the CAA each and every week. You know, Villanova, Delaware, Richmond is much different than Troy, Coastal, Arkansas State, who. I don't know why I used Arkansas State. They weren't necessarily the best this season, but like it's just a much different echelon of teams. What was that jump going from from CAA to Sun Belt? Um, it was it was definitely a, a lot more physical for sure, and it was just a lot more competition. Like you didn't know what you were gonna get game in and game out. Like even if some of the teams were at the bottom of the conference, to say, like yeah. you were still gonna get a great game out of them no matter what. Like because um. Like you said, Arkansas State, like you said, they weren't really probably not the best team, but they, yeah. they had good athletes and they had like good players in their team. Like they, they were a lot better than I feel yeah. like a, a CAA team that that we would usually play. Yeah, like um, a like an Albany type when you play when you go up to Albany. And you're um, playing their- um, yeah, some some of like the smaller ones, yeah, <laughs> for sure. But I mean, like, shoot, some of the CAA teams are were just on par, like, and yeah, and honestly what can, can compete too like like Villanova we always had good games with Villanova like game like season after season every yeah. time so I mean it's 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 a difference but it, I'd say the the biggest difference was in the uh with the big guys definitely the trenches for sure so that makes sense to worry about that much <laughs> <laughs> all right so to wrap it up I got some rapid fire questions first thing that comes to your mind just hit me with the answer I think I got five of them for you. First one, easy softball pregame meal. Um, spaghetti. <laughs> That's all we have, man. That I was expecting something like that, like a very classic carbo loading um, type of thing. But <laughs> every time. <laughs> um, so pregame song or songs? Did you have a song that you had to listen to it before every game? Um, not really. I I feel like I was always listening to a different album before. Okay. So what new was always dropping too? What was the album you were listening to pre coastal? That's a great question, <laughs> man. I don't even know. It had to have been something good. I might have to start playing that before games now. Shoot, actually, I don't think I had my headphones on before the coastal game, so maybe I was music list before the game. Whatever, Damn. whatever Braceforth was playing, I guess. Yeah, you, the "Can't Hold Us" by Macklemore about six years. I guess. Six I, years guess out. <laughs> I guess. I guess that's my stuff. All right, so I guess you got to keep listening to that. But um, <laughs> all right, so then, what was your favorite away stadium you played in your JMU career? Man, that's a hard one. Um. App State this year, I'll say I'll say that App State this year for sure. That was that was a beautiful stadium. I bet, yeah. Least favorite, but UNH. Easily, really? Easily, their locker room was terrible. Oh my gosh, easily <laughs> their visitor locker room was terrible. Oh my okay, I I didn't expect UNH. I've heard a lot of bad things from Rhode Island, but. UNH, okay. Uh, I, I can see that because the stands, I guess, in terms of like actually playing. I I guess so. Well, I, I, I guess that's fair. 
here's a question because UNH always seemed like something weird was happening there. Oh like God, it was terrible. like a comeback one year, it, it, just we like a weird loss another year. Just it was never. It seemed like an easy game. Why right. was it ever, that way? Ever, I have no idea. It must just be like a like an ongoing trend. I have no idea because I remember when I was when I was um watching my brother play here and he yeah. came up and they were up like forty two to fourteen or something crazy. Yeah, at the end of the game they'd go and get like three onside kicks and go and score every time. <laughs> like this is ridiculous. Yeah. And then uh, every time we I've played against them, like it's always been a close game too. So. I don't know. I guess it's just good coaching. I, yeah, they were extremely well coached, but yeah, for it, was, sure. it was always very odd from a from a fan perspective. So I'm glad I'm glad that you, you guys as the players kind of felt that way too. Um and last one, favorite game you ever played in? Probably. That's hard. That's I have to say coastal. It was my best game and yeah. it was my last one. That makes sense. For sure. Dope. So, yeah, appreciate the time, Devin. Uh, we wish you all the luck in your in your pre, pre-NFL workouts, everything like that, your preparation heading into it all. And uh, we hope to see you playing professionally at the next level and on Sundays or wherever you may be post, post-JMU. We really appreciate the time. No, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you having me. Of course. Thank you guys so much for tuning into the JMU Sports News Podcast presented by Bet Online and Three Notched Beer. We'll see you guys soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day. See ya. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.